Hi, Mark. I'm Peggy. My student number is S zero four four one zero two eight, and I'm a freshman. Joshua four, feats of memory anyone can do. I'd like to invite you to close your eyes. Imagine yourself standing outside the front door of your home. I'd like to. I'd like you to notice the color of the door, the material that it's made out of. Now visualize a pack of of red noticed on the bicycles. Laughter. They run. They are competing in the naked bicycles race, and they are headed straight out. And they are headed straight for your front doors. I need you to actually see this. They are pedaling really hard. They are sweaty. They are bouncing around a lot, and they crash straight into the front door of your home. Bicycles fly everywhere. Wheels roll past you. Spokes stand up in awkward places. Step over the threshold, the thr the threshold of your door into your foyer, your hallway, whatever on the other side. And appreciate the quality of the light. The light is shining down on Cookie Monster. Cookie Monster is waving at you at you from his perch on top of ten horse. It's a talking horse. We can pra practically feel his blue fur tickling your nose. You can smell a oatmeal raisin cookie that is about to shovel into his mouth. Walk past him. Walk up. Walk past him into your living room. In your living room, in full imaginative broadband, picture Britney Spears. She's scantily clad. She's dancing on your coffee table. And she's singing, "Hitting, hit me, baby, one more time." And then, follow me into our kitchen. In your kitchen, the floor has been paved over with a yellow brick road, and out of your oven are coming towards you Dorothy, the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Lion from the Wizard of Oz, hand in hand, skipping straight towards you. Okay, open your eyes. I want to tell you about a very bizarre contest that is held every spring in New York City. It's called the United States Memory Championship. And I had gone to cover this contest a few years back as as a science journalist, expecting, I guess, that is that is what's going to be like the Super Bowl of savants. This was a bunch of guys and a few ladies, widely varying both age and hygienic upkeep. Laughter. They were memorizing hundreds of random numbers, looking at them just once. They were memorizing the name of dozens and dozens and dozens of strangers. They were memorizing entire poems in just a few minutes. They were competing to see who could memorize the order of a shuffle pack of playing cards the fastest. It was like this is unbelievable. These people must be freaks of nature. And I started talking to a few of the competitors. This is a guy called Ed Cook, who had come over from England, where he had won the best. Where he had one of the best trained memories, and I said to him, "Ed, when did you realize that you were a savant?" And Ed was like, "I'm not a savant. In fact, I have just an average memory. Everybody who competes in this contest will tell you that they have just an average memory." We've all trained ourselves to perform these utterly miraculous feats of memory using a set of ancient techniques. Techniques invent, invented 2,500 years ago in Greece. The same techniques that Cicero had used to memorize his speeches, that medieval scholars had used to memorize entire books. And I said, "Wow! How come I never heard of this before?" And we are standing outside a competition hall, and Ed, who is a wonderful, brilliant, but somewhat eccentric English guy, said to me, "Josh, you are an American journalist. Do you know Britney Spears?" I was like, "What? No. Why? Because I really want to teach Britney Spears how to memorize the order of a shuffle pack of playing cards on U.S. national television. I will prove to the world that anybody." Can That anybody can do us, loved her. I was like, "Well, I'm not Britney Spears, but maybe you could teach me. I mean, you've got to start somewhere, right?" And that was the beginning of a very strange journey for me. 
I ended up spending the better part of the next year not only training my memory, but also investigating it, trying to understand how it works, why it sometimes doesn't work, and what its potential might be. And I met a host of really interesting people. This is a guy called E. P. He's an amnestic who had very possibly the worst memory in the world. His memory was so bad that he didn't even remember he had a memory problem, which is amazing. And he was this incredibly tragic figure, but he was a window into the extent to which our memories can make make us who we are. At the other end of the spectrum, I met this guy. This is Kim Peek, who was the basis for Dustin Hoffman's character in the movie Red Man. We spent an afternoon together in a Salt Lake City public library, memorizing phone books, which was scintillating, scintillating laughter. And I went back and I read a whole host of memory treatises. Treatise is written two thousand plus years ago in Latin, in antiquity, an antiquity, and then later in the Middle Ages, and I learned a whole bunch of really interesting stuff. One of really interesting things that I learned is that once upon a time, this idea of having a trained, disciplined, cultivated memory was not really so alien as it would seem to us to be today. Once upon a time. People investing their memories in the in the laboriously furnishing their minds. Over the last few mill- millennia, we've invented a series of techni- technologies, from the alphabet to the score, to the scroll, to the codex, the printing press, photography, the computer, the smartphone, that have made it progressively easier and easier for us to externalize our memories. For us to essentially outsource this fundamental human capacity, these technologies have made our modern world, modern world possible, but they've also changed us. They've changed us culturally, and I would argue that they've changed us cognitively. Having little need to remember anymore, it sometimes seems seems like we've forgotten how. One of the last pal. Places on Earth where we still find people passionate about this idea of a trained, disciplined, cultivated memory is at this totally singular memory contest. It's actually not singular. There are contests held all over the world. When and I was fascinated. I wanted to know how do these guys do it. A few years back, a group of researchers. At University College London, brought a bunch of memory champions, champions in the lab. They wanted to know: Do these guys have brains that are somehow structurally, anatomic, anatomically different from the rest of ours? The answer was no. The answer was no. Are they smarter than the rest of us? They gave them a bunch of cognitive tests, and the answer was not really. There was, however, one really interesting and telling difference between the brands of the memory champions and the control subjects that that they were comparing them to. When they put these guys in an fMRI machine, scanned their brains while they were memorizing numbers and people's faces and pictures of snowflakes, they found that m- the memory champions were lighting up different parts of the brain than any than everyone else. Of note. They were using, or they, or they seem to be using, a part of the brain that's involved in special memory and navigation. Why? And is there something that the rest of us can learn from this? The sport of competitive mem- memorizing is driven by a kind of arm race where every year somebody comes up with a new way to remember more stuff more quickly. And then the rest of the field has to play catch up. This is my friend Brian Pritmore, three-time world memory champion. On his desk is from, in front of him are thirty-six shuffle packs of playing cards that he is about to try to memorize in one hour, using a technique that he invented, and he alone has mastered. He used a similar technique to memorize the. 
precise order of four thousand and one hundred forty random binary digits in half an hour. Laughter. Yeah. And while there are a whole host of ways of remembering stuff in these competitions, everything, all of the techniques that are being used, ultimately come down to a concept that psychologists refer to as elaborative encoding. And it's well illustrated by a nifty paradox known as the Baker Baker paradox, which goes like this: If I tell two people to remember the same word, if I say to you, "Remember that there is a guy named Baker," that's his name, and I say to you, "Remember that there is a guy who is a baker," okay? And I come back to you at some point later on, and I say, "Do you remember that word that I told you a while back? Do you remember what it was?" The person who was taught his his name is Baker, is less likely to remember the same word than the person who was told his job is a baker. Some word, different amount of remembering. That's weird. What's going on here? Well, the name Baker doesn't actually mean anything to you. It is entirely untethered from all of the other memories floating around in your skull. But the common noun baker, we know bakers. Bakers wear funny white hats. Bakers have flour on their hands. Bakers smell good when they come when they come home from work. Maybe we even know a baker. And when we first hear that word, we start putting this associate associate national associational hooks into it. That makes it easier to fish it back out back out at some later date. The entire art. Of what's go, of what is going on in this memory contest, and the entire art of remembering stuff better, better in everyday life, is figuring out ways to transform capital capital B bakers into lower case B bakers, to take it in to take information that is lacking in contest, in significance, in meaning, and transform it in some way, so that it becomes. Meaningful in the light of all the other things that you have in your mind. One of the more more elaborate techniques for doing this dates back 2,500 years to ancient Greece. It came to be known as the Memory Palace. The story behind its creation goes like this: There was a poet called Simonides, who was attending a banquet. He was actually the higher entertain entertainment. Because back then, if you wanted to throw a really shaming, a really slamming party, you didn't hire a DJ. You hire a poet, and he stands up, delivers his poem from memory, walks out the door, and at the moment he does, the ban the banquet hall collapses. Kills everybody inside. It doesn't just kill everybody; it mangles the bodies beyond all recognition. Nobody can say who was inside. Nobody can say where they were sitting. The bodies can't probably be buried. It's one tragedy compounding another. Simonides, standing outside, the sole survivor amid the wreckage, closes his eyes and has this realization, which is that in his mind's eye he can see where each of the guests at the banquet had been sitting, and he takes the relatives by the hand. And guides them each to their loved ones amid the wreckage. What Simonides figured out at the moment is something that I think we all kind of intuitive, intuitively know, which is that as bad as we are remembering names and phone numbers and word for word instructions from our colleagues, we have really exceptional visual and spatial memories. If I ask you. To recount the first ten words of the story that I just told you about Sim Simonides, chances are you would have a tough time with it. But I would wager, but I would wager that if I asked you to recall who is sitting on top of the talking ten horse in your foyer right now, you would be able to see that. The idea behind memory palace is to create this imagine. Add a face in your mind's eye and populate it with images of the things that you want to remember. The crazier, 
weirder, more bizarre, funnier, raunchier, stinger images. The more unforgettable it's likely to be. This is advice that that goes back 2,000 plus years to the earliest Latin memory traditions. So how does this work? That sailor lad to have been invited to the center stage to give a speech, and you want to do it more me- from memory, and you want to do it f- the way that Cesar would have done it if he had if he had been invited to TEDx from two thousand years ago. Laughter. What you might do is picture yourself at the front door of your house, and you'd come up. With some sort of crazy, ridiculous, unforgettable image to remind you that the first thing you want to talk about is totally bizarre contest, laughter, and then you'd go inside your house, and you would see an image of Cookie Monster on top of the Mister Ad, and that would remind you that you would want to then introduce your friend Ad Cook, and then you'd see an image. Of Britney Spears to remind of this funny, anecdote, anecdote you want to tell, and you'd go into your kitchen, and the first topic you were going to talk about was the strange journey that you went, that you went on for a year, and you'd have some friends to help you remember that. This is how Roman or orders memorize their speeches, not word for word. Which is just going to screw you up, but topic from topic. In fact, the phrase topic sentence that comes from the Greek word topos, which im- which means place. That's a vestige of when people used to think about or oratory and rhetoric in this sorts of special terms. The phrase in the first place. That's like in the first place of your memory pl- palace. I thought this was just not. This was just fascinating, and I got really into it. And I went to a few more of these memories contests, and I had this notion that I might write something longer about this subculture of competitive memorizers. But there was a problem. The problem was that a memory contest is pathologically boring event. Laughter. Truly, it is like a bunch of people sitting around taking taking the SATs. I mean. The most dramatic at guest is when somebody starts messaging their tempos, and I'm a journalist. I need something to write about. I know that there's incredible stuff happening in that in these people's mind, but I don't have access to it. And I realized if I if I was going to tell this story, I needed to walk in their shoes a little bit. And so I started trying to spend fifteen or twenty minutes every morning before I sat down with my New York Times, just trying to remember something. Maybe it was a poem. Maybe it was names from an old yearbook that I bought at a flea market. And I found that there was a there was a shocking fun. I never would have had expected that. It was fun because this is actually not about training your memory. What you're doing. As you're trying to get better and better at creating, at dreaming up, this utterly ludicrous, ludicrous, raunchy, hilarious, and hopefully unforgettable images in your mind's eye, and I got pretty into it. This is what, this is me wearing my standard competitive memorizer's take training kit. Laughter. It's a pair of earmuffs and a set of safety goggles. That have been mixed over, except for two small pinos, pinos, because destruction is a competitive memorizer's greatest enemy. Enemy. I ended up coming back to that same contest that I have covered a year later, earlier, and I had this notion that I might enter it, sort of and sort of as an experiment in part participatory journalism. It make I I thought maybe a nice epilog to all my research. Problem was the experiment was when haywire. I won the contest. Laughter, which really wasn't supposed to happen. Applause. <coughs> Now 
It is nice to be able to memorize pages and phone numbers and shopping lists, but it's actually kind of beside the point. These are just tricks. They work because they are based on some pretty basic principles about how our brains work, and you don't have to be building memory palaces or memorizing. On memorizing packs of playing cards to benefit from a little bit of insight of how your mind works. We often talk about people with great memories as though it were some sort of an innate gift, but that is not the case. Great memories are learned at the most basic level. We remember when we pay attention. <coughs> we remember when we are deeply engaged. We remember when we are able to take a piece of information and experience, and figure out why it is meaningful to us, why it is significant, why it's colorful. When we are able to transform it in some way that makes sense in the light of all of the other things floating around in our minds, when we are able to transform bakers into bakers, the memory palace, this memory techniques, they are just shortcuts. In fact, they are not even. Really shortcuts. They work because they make you work. They force a kind of depth of depth of processing, a kind of mindfulness. Mindfulness. <coughs> That most most of us don't normally walk around exercising, but there actually are no shortcuts. This is how stuff is made memorable. And I think if there's one thing that I want to that I want to leave you with. It's what EP, the amnesic who couldn't even remember he had a memory problem, left me left me with, which is the notion that our lives are the sum of our memories. How much are we willing to lose from our already short lives by losing ourselves in our blackberries, our iPhones, but not paying attention to the human being across from us who is talking with us by being so lazy? That we're not willing to process deeply. I learned firsthand that there are incredible memory capacities latent in all of us. But if you want to live a memorable life, you have to be the kind of person who remembers to remember. Thank you. Applause.